This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today did something really cool in the venture capital space, a big research project, essentially looking at 30,000 data points on nearly every factor when it comes to startups. And he found out all kinds of cool information that goes against the grain. And to start with, whatever you might imagine about a Silicon Valley startup, a unicorn, a super successful startup is probably incorrect. For example, most unicorns, those once in a blue moon companies, the founders have no industry experience. Is there an advantage to being a solo founder? Yes. Are you disadvantaged if you are a solo founder? No, you're not. What about a non-technical CEO? You're not disadvantaged either. The data doesn't bear it out. People might have personal opinions, but what Ali Tamaseb, my guest, did today was look at the data. Less than 15% of startups went through any kind of accelerator program. And here's the kicker that really strikes me. And it's very much the Google story. Over half of the startups had strong competitors when they were starting. So being first to market the first with a great idea, that doesn't actually matter. Again, my guest today, Ali Tamasab, took all of this information, he put it into a really cool book called Super Founders, What Data Reveals About Billion Dollar Startups. Of course, somebody like me who's into trend following and data, because people think that you just get to have personal opinions about the markets and trading, no, it's all about data. And Ali goes down the exact same path. Give me the damn data, then I will know something, not just Bob and his freaking opinion. Without any further delay, let's jump right into my guest today, Ali Tamasab, and talk about data, Silicon Valley, and startups. I love the idea of seeing something that's working. When you see something big that's working, and then you start to wonder, how did that happen? What was going on behind the scenes? What did the data say? Back when I did my first book, I was looking into this subject of trading, this particular trading strategy. And the way that I looked at it was to look at the performance data. And the performance data told so many stories. In your case, you want to know, how did these Silicon Valley giants, these great names that we all hear about. What was the founding position, the starting position? What did their backgrounds look like? Which I find is a fascinating way to go because everyone has in their mind what they think that everybody went to Yale and they've got the silver spoon and all this other kind of stuff. You are the guy today, and we're going to get into, I guess, some of this nitty gritty data. You're the guy today that's going to tell us that if you think all Silicon Valley tech giants are Yale silver spoon we can at least start them right there that that's the wrong way to think, correct? Correct, yeah. I mean, the data in the book is supposed to break some of the stereotypes and myths, which is oftentimes formed from narratives that we tend to hear the most frequently here from the media and the stories that get famous. There's a very strong narrative bias that all of us have in the startup ecosystem because there's five and 10 stories that are more famous than the others. The goal of the book was to show the stories of you know all 200, 300 of these billion dollar startups use data to holistically show what does and what does not matter. Let me get you past some of the kind of just all that initial stuff. At some point, you are a guy and you say, I'm going to look at data. So start me there. Where was the germ of the idea that I'm going to look at data, the data of all of these founders? Because you looked at what, is it 30,000 data points? Something crazy, some huge amount of data. Yeah. This is a lot of time and a lot of effort. What was the germ of the idea for you to go down this path? This started four years ago, and the data collection piece and everything actually took four years. 
and it was not automated. You cannot automate that. You cannot outsource that. For four years, every weekend, every evening, I had to sit down and one data point by one data point by one data point, collect this, which you know, after four years ended up becoming 30,000 data points. Let's even get before that. You have to even get to the idea to start to collect data. What was the start of that? That's my job. I'm a venture capitalist. That's my job to sort through a thousand companies that I hear a pitch and I have to end up investing in two, three, five companies per year. I wanted to see if I can build something that can help myself. And also through my kind of experience of seeing a lot of my own investments that became successful or other investments that became successful, I always felt like there is a difference between what ends up becoming successful and what the stories, what the media, what the popular mythology of Silicon Valley of startups tells us. And I definitely felt that there was a difference. And I wanted to see if, if there was an actually difference. Is everything luck or is everything privilege or is there something in between? And the answer doesn't exist anywhere. I took a long time to try to see if anybody has written a book or article or blog post or anything on it. But the data is so hard to gather that nobody had done it before that. Before we get into deciding what type of data and where you're going to find it and all that kind of stuff, at this moment in time when you realize no one else has done it, that's a nice feeling. Then it's like there's this extra energy boost. You can't stop now because you know, oh, wow, technically stumbled into something where no one else has done the work. That alone makes the whole journey exciting, doesn't it? It does. On the other hand, it, it's, <laughs> it would have been much easier if that data existed somewhere and I could analyze it or I could add the stories to it. We wouldn't be talking then. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, it was shocking to me that as venture capitalists, the industry deploys hundreds of billions of dollars in investments. We don't know what is luck, what is not. We don't have data on any of these things. So it was a little bit shocking to me that hundreds of billions of dollars gets deployed without any of this data being existed for the past you know, couple of decades. Okay. So you're in the space, you're in the venture capital world. That's your job. Now you start to smell this path to go down and you want to assemble data. How did you first decide what type of data you wanted to assemble? And then where did you start to go? So I wrote down 65 data elements that I felt could matter. These are the things that we discussed. These are the things that as venture capitalists, we pay attention to from the founders' backgrounds and early team, their career paths and their history and previous entrepreneurial endeavors to the origin of the idea, the market, the competitive landscape, defensibility, pivots, and fundraising, fundraising history, quality of the investors, how long it took, how fast it was, was the previous valuation. So I wrote down 65 elements that I felt like could matter started collecting each of these data points for all the unicorn startups that was founded in the previous 15 years. Where did you go for the data sources? Because obviously, as you are pointing out, no one else has done the work. There's some elbow grease here. There's some effort. What did you do? What sources did you go to? It's a very manual and judgmental task. I go to LinkedIn profiles, to Crunchbase. I read their early interviews. I listened to their early podcasts. Sometimes I emailed these founders. I asked these questions. I used the internet archives and the Wayback Machine to go back and see what the internet looked like back in 2012 or back in 2008 to better understand what the market dynamics were or what the competitive landscape was or what was the sentiment about a specific company. So it was a lot of historical analysis trying to use the internet to go back using LinkedIn and Crunchbase and interviews and cold emailing a lot of these founders to gather these data points, basically one by one. Now you're ultimately looking for the data points that buttress founders. For the audience that doesn't really pay too close attention, speak to the word founder. I don't necessarily know if we used it as much. If I think back to the dot-com bubble, I don't think we use it as much Maybe we use different terminology, but today it's a really important term, founder. It definitely is. A lot of people pay a lot of attention to who they call a co-founder and who they don't call a co-founder. It's less of an operational role. There could be co-founders who don't take executive roles in a the company. There could be co-founders who are merely advisors of a company, and it happens a lot in biotech, for example. These are the people who start the company and bring the initial resources, but maybe at the different times, there's a different CEO. And a lot of times there's a bunch of executives. This is the early team. 
And what I cared the most is day one, when the company got started, was there anything different about this, about the people who thought about this idea and who were putting together the initial team and you know, raising the money than the other company? So I also collected this whole 65 data elements on every company that had raised $3 million in investment and did not become a unicorn. So on everything, I could compare and contrast the data between these two groups, the unicorns and the non-unicorns. Your biggest conclusion that comes from that, the short version before people get a chance to read the book? I think if I can summarize the whole book in one paragraph is it's that a lot of first layer proxy metrics that we sometimes try to link to success, for example, age, being technical, university degree, the source of the idea, not being competitive. There's a lot of these kind of first layer high level proxy metrics. And if you just want to look at them, there is no correlation with success. Age is not correlated with success. Being technical or not is not. Your university degree is not correlated with success. What does correlate with success is these secondary layer things, like the character of the entrepreneur, like their previous history and track record of what they've built and what type of value they've created, the type of pain point they're going after. And so a lot of these secondary layer things, when you go deeper down to the idea and the team and the founders, they matter. But the first layer things that we sometimes believe have an impact on success, they don't. As I say, things like age and solving a personal problem or number of co-founders. When you think about, and this is a tough question because there's so many different silos of data, so many different data points, but as you started to get into this process of digging in the data, being this kind of research scientist, what was the first moment where you and the industry now you start this data digging project where you really had an aha moment that you were like, wow, I think I just saw a light bulb go off that is not generally understood in our industry and by the general public. I first published the first part of my data, a little bit of the data that I had collected on a Medium post, on a blog post at the end of 2018, so two and a half years ago. That article, you know, a lot of people read that and that became a viral article. And a lot of, I actually learned from the people, you know, what are the things that they cared about and what are some of the things that was the biggest types of stereotypes that were broken to them. One of them was domain expertise, that one of the things that the data showed was it's only a minority of these billion dollar company founders that had worked in the same industry before in consumer technologies and even in enterprise technologies, healthcare and biotech being an exception to this. And I think this is one of the main things that, that surprised a lot of people, including myself. And I had to you know, go back to the data a bunch of times to check and double check that information. Domain expertise in this sense, and I'll use the big picture example, it's not really relevant to your work, but I'm sure that nobody expected Jeff Bezos in 1995 to be running Whole Foods in 2021 or the Washington Post. The domain expertise, I mean, those barriers just seem to have just disappeared now across all industry. Exactly. And that's when you look at it as surface layer. You were in e-commerce and now you're running a journalism or a media company. And on surface, they look like two different industries. But when you go deeper, running companies is the same set of things, selling your vision, attracting executives, attracting board members, attracting financing. So on the second layer, on the deeper layer, it's the same soft skills. It's the same connections. It's the same resources. And on the first proxy layer, it may look like, okay, you didn't come from that industry. A lot of people may think that does matter or that is going to be a negative point about a founder. Let's talk about education. Let's dive into this. We could probably spend the rest of our conversation on education and perceptions of education, specifically perceptions of college education. I'll throw a few data points out for me and you. I know you are born in Iran? Correct. Yes. Right. Okay. So immigrant to the States, which anybody that's got a pulse realizes without knowing anything about your backstory is like, okay, that guy is either smart or tenacious or hardworking or all of the above, and perhaps more so than the typical born in America, which is kind of like me, a born in America guy who had built in advantages. Look, I'm currently in Saigon. I have a perception and a feeling for how Asian students in particular study. And it's like, okay, we all know that when it comes to the Ivy Leagues, 
that if there was no subjective criteria, like 100% of the admissions into Ivy Leagues would be Asian students because they are the ones that whether someone says it's they've worked the hardest, the highest IQs, they figure out how to get the best SATs, et cetera, they would dominate. Let's speak to education and the specific idea of the college degree. Everyone's seen the social network. Everyone knows that Mark Zuckerberg left early and we can find all kinds of stories about people leaving early. Let's talk about college education in particular. One of the stereotypes is around that it's that most of these successful founders were college dropouts. In their early 20s, they were super, super geniuses who came up with an idea in college, came out, that became a billion dollar idea. And most of the time from, you know, Ivy League kind of universities. One reason for that is the two kind of most famous examples of what makes into the popular lexicon of entrepreneurship, Zuckerberg from Social Network Movie and Bill Gates, both Harvard dropouts. And that's what creates this perception. But when you look at the data, this is a specific case, Ivy League college dropout, that's less than 4% of all the billion dollar companies that were created in the past 15 years. So 96% does not look like that. There are more people with PhDs than there are college dropouts. There are a lot of people with law degrees, medical degrees. Many of them are professors. There's a lot of MBAs. There's 21% of billion dollar companies that had MBAs. And obviously, you know, a large percentage of these founders only had a bachelor's degree in their education. When I compared the billion dollar group with the non-billion dollar group, the non-unicorns group, I basically observed no real significant difference between the education level of these founders. So for example, 20% of every company that's getting funded had an MBA founding CEO and 20% of all the billion dollar companies that are created have an MBA founding CEO. Same percentage for PhDs, same percentage for law degrees. So at the end of the day, it's reinforcing the fact that these are proxy rules. There could be somebody that was a college dropout. They were brilliant and they had done a bunch of things and they go on to become successful. There might be a bunch of college dropouts that do not become successful or drop out for the wrong reason. Same thing. You can be a PhD and have only done research and don't have any business acumen. You might be a PhD who has done a bunch of projects and interned at a bunch of companies and created a bunch of projects along the way. So it's more about that secondary layer of, I don't care if you have a PhD or not. I don't care if you have an MBA or not. What have you done during that time? What have you learned during that time? Who have you networked with during that time? Conclusion, the degree doesn't matter. Correct. And that was why I kind of brought up, I mean, I love that all the hard work comes from Asia to try to take the slots and excel in American universities. But I do think in some ways, it's sometimes misguided. Because if you just think alone, the degree will infer greatness, that can be a really rude awakening when you get the degree, can it? Part of that history is an immigration story. People like me and my friends use education as a path for immigration to the United States. A lot of these people have to get a PhD until they get a job here. That's a separate part of this. Feel free to correct me anywhere. You can punch me right back in the head. I will not be offended. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just retell the story of the data. It's not saying not having specific degrees are bad or having specific degrees are, is good. It's basically everybody had their own path. And some may have had a postdoc or there's a bunch of examples of professors leaving their academic work after years of getting to the pinnacle of their work in academia and then starting billion dollar companies. There's also people who didn't even start college and went straight out of high school and started a bunch of companies, small successes, big successes, and eventually started a billion dollar company. On its own, what degree you have, that's less of a measure of success than what you have done during that time and what you've learned from that experience. When people read your book, they're going to find all kinds of names and all kinds of backstories, super interesting. So here's a big picture question that might be hard for you in the sense that you have so many good influences. Is there one name in the time that you have been working on this project, your time in Silicon Valley, is there one name that truly influences you, inspires you the most? I know you probably don't like the phrase the most, but is there a name? Is there someone where you can look back and go, gosh, that person really just gave me the education 
their time was so invaluable. Is there one at the top of the heap for you? Let me respond to that question in a different way. I can say Rachel Carlson, founder of Guild Education, that was one of the more interesting interviews. That's in my chapter seven, which is about geography and industries. She has a very interesting story of everybody moves to Silicon Valley to succeed. She moved out of Silicon Valley to succeed. So she's already raised money here, employed here. And she moved the company out of Silicon Valley to Denver. And still, you know, the company became a multi-billion dollar company in the education sector. That is one very interesting story. What in particular about her, her message, her tone, her inspiration, what in particular about her really caused you to give that name first to be? I love when entrepreneurs are intentional about what they do and it turns out well for them. A lot of things are just happenstance and luck, things that happen. But when you see an entrepreneur who took an action that was against the advice of many and against what was popular at the time, but she had a reason to do it and she persuaded her board and co-founders to do it and it worked out well for them. One of the things that I always say, there's very few independent thinkers in any industry, in any part of the world. A lot of people follow trends and follow the hype. And in the short term, it's costly to go against the crowd and it's costly to not follow the hypes in investment, in social life and everything. But in the long term, it's these independent thinkers that I think create trends and make big successes for themselves. This was one clear example to me of somebody who was independently thinking and became successful. So it's interesting, as I bring up the topic of education and degrees, we all spend so much time to uniformly go through the system, but the ones that really excel are the ones that literally get through this uniform system where they have to follow all the rules, then they get on the other side, and they all of a sudden have to realize, oh my gosh, I've got to be different. Yeah, I don't specifically have a date on that, although I have it on the product and I can talk about it. Most of the stories of these people, you know, they were rebels. They were people who thought differently and did actions differently. And you know, most of the time, they were not afraid of doing things that none of their peers were doing. Even dropping out of college, we're saying that's a minority, but it's such a big, audacious act that you're at Stanford and you're studying and say, okay, whatever, I'm leaving. <laughs> that's hard. A lot of these founders have had these types of stories where they've had to say no to amazing opportunities to be able to get to where they are today. As we first started talking, you almost had a comeback to me where I said something about 60 minutes or an hour. I don't know if you felt like you couldn't fill it or, I mean, gosh, we could talk about this for hours and hours. You can see I would pull it out of you, right? <laughs> we can. I'm, I'm pretty sure we can talk for 10 hours. I don't really like when podcasts are short and their listeners are to the point and they don't have to go through it if they don't want to for an hour. Get to the gist of it in 25 minutes. You say you like that or don't like that? I like it when it's short. I like it when it's get to the point fast. And I can get to the point fast here. I got to dig through and get some data. There's a lot of data points here. I can't absorb this in five minutes. There's no way. <laughs> Solo founders. So a lot of people might have a perception in the industry and outsiders looking in, got this great idea. I've got this great work experience. I've got this motivation. I've got this drive, but it's just me. It's just me. I've got no chance. I don't have the team Sand Hill Road guys want to see. I don't have a team that I can take in with me and win them all over. It's just me. So I can't do anything. There has been this longstanding stereotype against solo founders. And it's a fact that it's not very common to see solo founders of super successful companies. But when you compare the two groups, the billion dollar groups and the non-billion dollar groups, you see they've had the same level of achievement, regardless of the number of co-founders. So another thing basically data set is number of co-founders, again, on its own, that's not a predictor of success. You can be a solo founder and succeed. You're as likely to succeed as a solo founder as your two co-founders or three or four or five. It matters who they are. And the same thing with solo founders. You may be a solo founder, but you definitely need a team. You definitely need to hire other people. You may start alone and you may raise a little bit of funding and then you may hire people. If you have named one person a founder, that's a case for it with like Zoom, Eric Yuan of Zoom, for example, that's fine. And you're just as likely to succeed. A lot of these solo founders of these billion dollar companies, they had 
a little bit of more track record compared to the others, the people with two co-founders or three co-founders in terms of previous success in startups. They've already had some reputation, some credibility, the ways to attract a team and get funding that they were fine just going at it alone and, and making it happen. Let's keep it at Zoom for a second since we are on Zoom. Doing this podcast, I started this podcast in 2012. Most of the time I've been in Asia, the way to communicate has often been Skype, Skype to Skype or Skype to landline for some of those, bless them, 80-year-old Nobel Prize winners that weren't using technology that I had to speak to. I love speaking to, but now all of a sudden in the last year and a half or so, and everyone that's a Skype user can think about all the negatives, but all of a sudden, how in the world, how in the world could something so established as Skype owned by Microsoft, not originally, but owned by Microsoft for many years, how in blazes could there possibly be a new entrant who in their right mind would wake up and say, I'm gonna go against Microsoft and I'm gonna take on Skype because there's an opportunity there. Everyone uses Skype. Everyone knows about Skype. Everyone knows there's problems with Skype. That might be the grain of the attack onto Skype from Zoom. Let's unpack the idea that firmly entrenched entrance already there. If you look at that alone, you might miss something, huh? Exactly. It wasn't just Skype. It was WebEx. It was Polycom. There was a lot of enterprise tools for decades. They were selling to large companies. Basically, you're going after Cisco and you're going after Microsoft in enterprise sales of technology. Nuts. That seems crazy. Just crazy. That's nuts. Yeah. That is. When you go back and look at Eric Yuan, who founded Zoom, he basically was competing with himself. He was the vice president at Cisco WebEx that was running a 1,000-person team developing this. And before that, he was a seventh employee at WebEx. That's how he came from China to the United States as a seventh employee on a visa, rose at the ranks, and then WebEx was acquired by Cisco, and then he had a large team. And the problem there... And that's the same thing with Skype and everything else, was legacy. There was legacy code. And in 2012, when Eric Yuan came out to build Zoom, the problem was Cisco was not willing to get rid of that legacy code, which was written back in 1997. So the Skype, you was the, the Cisco WebEx you were using in 2012, that was basically 15-year-old code that was still running. Eric Yuan was like, this is not going to work. However much we optimize this, this is not going to solve all the reliability issues that our customers have, and nobody's happy. He came out and rebuilt the whole thing from the ground up. Yes, it took a lot of money and energy, but because there was no legacy systems, now Zoom had the better quality and it was a better product, and they innovated so much on all the you know, different elements and the technical parts of how to make video connections and video telecommunication more reliable and faster and with less lag. That's why it worked because it was a massive market. It had very strong competitors, but nobody was happy with what they had. And that's the case with every incumbent industry that nobody's super happy with what they already have because these companies are relying on 10, 15 year old legacy systems and nobody has the audacity to put aside billions of dollars of investment and start from the scratch. And that's where you see a lot of these new companies come in and create a better, delightful experience and product and just win because they have a better product. That doesn't always happen. You can't always win because you have a better product. But if you can raise a lot of money and you can build a better product and you can build a good sales, go to market motion, then you can. You can overcome massive markets that have very, very strong players. Cisco WebEx had about 50% market share in 2020, in 2012. And then in 2018, basically Zoom had that much market share. So they had completely replaced WebEx in about eight years. Okay, pretend it's just me and you talking, no one else is listening, and it's just you and a couple of buddies, and you're looking around Silicon Valley at some of the most established tech companies around, and you look at them and you're like, somebody is going to Skype and WebEx like Zoom did, and it's coming. We just don't know who or how, but it's coming. There's no one else listening. So who will go by the way of the dinosaur who's currently out there as an established player right now? I think if you look at many of the companies that were established 20, 30 years ago, they face the same risk of either being eliminated. They will remain as a big company, but 
there will be new companies that would eat their lunch and come in and compete. Microsoft, Google, Salesforce, Oracle, all of these large big companies, I think they have billion dollar inefficiencies that would be solved and would be taken away by new startups. Airtable, Notion, these are companies going after office product by Microsoft and they're succeeding at it. Same thing, a lot of companies developing CRMs, going after Salesforce, and a lot of companies going after what what Google's trying to do. It's just a matter of time that new startups come in and create something that would make a part of the product of Salesforce or Oracle and every other Microsoft obsolete. Let's see if we can get controversial for just a second on a side tangent. As I look at the tech universe, specifically social media, I look at everybody, look, everyone likes to play. Everyone wants to put videos out. They want to make comments, et cetera. And then something new has happened in the last five or six years where a lot of the social media companies have also become censors. And I think everyone kind of knows that there's a political bent to the censorship. It's pretty obvious. That's Fair enough. People own a company, they can do what they want to do. But that does present a unique opportunity. And I think back to the early 90s, where perhaps there was only one form of cable news. And then all of a sudden, a guy named Roger Ailes said, well, heck, what if we give the conservative audience Fox News? Boom, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. It sure seems like that the desire to use a company for something beyond than what it was meant for. Okay, we have a fantastic search engine. We have a fantastic social media platform. But then to take it a step further and say, we are now going to do something with it that might, I don't know, offend a part of our audience, whether it's the left or the right, who cares? That seems to present opportunity right there. Exactly. And that's part of a problem of growing up. These are pains of growing up. And these massive companies, they end up bugged down by political problems, by employee management problems. There's a lot of things that happens to when companies grow large and they have a lot of employees and they slow down and they naturally become more conservative. And that's where new startups can come and use that conservatism and the slowness to take a little part of their market cap and take a little bit of part of their market share, build a product of their own. And once they use those inefficiencies to you know, create a medium, super growing fast company for themselves, they will become the company that could be outcompeted. And that cycle continues one company by one company by one company in generations. And you know, every couple of decades, they will become an incumbent and there will be new startups coming and taking their lunch. I do remember when the, you know, back to the dot-com bubble, it was a little more fun when there was 10 search engines. Somebody was the leader one day, AltaVista, InfoSeek, and then somebody else was the new leader within months. It was a little crazy to see that. And then we've reached you know, the last five, 10 years where things became a little more stable and consistent. So I do look forward to that. Let me take you to you for a moment because, okay, there's got to be a backstory here. I want to know the backstory. Okay, you're in Iran. You're born in Iran. At what age did you come to the States? I came here when I was 24, I guess. 23, 24. I went to London before that. I went to school. I started a company in Iran. I you know, went to school, studied electrical engineering there, and then went to London, studied biomedical engineering, brain computer interface stuff before Elon Musk made space cool. Started another company, grew to millions of dollars in revenues, a large group of people, and then came to Silicon Valley, went to the dark side. You don't think I'm going to let you get away with that short of an answer, do you? <laughs> 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 okay, so take me back to Iran. You're in Iran as a teenager. And obviously, you've got some IQ to work with. You're playing with things. What was the thinking, though? Like the why is going to be obvious, of course, access to other people and universities and capital and whatnot. But what's your thinking when you're a 17 or 18 year old in Iran? I was a geek at, at the time. I am still. My whole thinking back then was Olympia. I won medals in international physics and coding Olympiads. So that was my whole thing. That led me also afterwards to stock trading in, in the national market there, developing an application, something like iTrades or eTrades or Robinhood back in the day in that market, in that part of the stock market to give access to trading. To the extent you are able, desire, this is just a curiosity part. Okay, so you're a young guy, geek guy in Iran. Did you enjoy being there? I mean, was everything cool? And you just had this global tech mindset and you knew you needed to reach out and get into the kind of global slipstream of other people like you. What was the thinking? It's better than people would think it is. 
living there and it's worse than people think it is living there. It's kind of a daily paradox living in Iran because things are much better than people think in West of how it is there. It's pretty modern. There's a lot of industries and a tech industry and everything else. But on the other hand, there's a lot deeper rooted problems with everything going on. So there's a lot of people who want to get out. As you say, it's an isolated country. So you, the best you can do there is to be the best inside that country. It's once you come to the US that you can play at the global scale. There's a lot of ambitious people like me. We have the largest brain drain in the world of people coming out of the country and studying in the US and you know, starting companies here or working as executives for large companies. It's a better quality of life, obviously. And also it gives you access to international mindset and thinking. And you've got to be a good example of what we're talking about today, which is not having a bias to what somebody should be, because ultimately it's about the energy and the effort of that individual, their drive, their mentality, their mindset. Those are the things that are important. So where somebody comes from, once you get around other like-minded people, I mean, what's the relevance? It's those kind of secondary layer things, the grit and what type of value they had created. When I even look at the data, there's a lot of these billion dollar founders who may have started from building a nonprofit, from a project that was not supposed to make the money, but it made, or from something that just made a small amount of money. And you see that a lot in immigrants, you see that a lot in US born citizens, that's a characteristic and that you can't find that characteristic necessarily in proxy rules what schools they went to over which country they came from or what education level they had, but rather in each of their own kind of personal stories. These kind of things that matter more for the success rather than the proxy level, proxy rules, first layer information and data points we have. You'll appreciate this as an immigrant, as I'm in a developing country, Vietnam. I had a conversation the other day with a, another guest. I was speaking very nicely about what I'm about to say. But I mentioned something about hustle and that drive and that desire that I see in a place like Vietnam that I sometimes don't see amongst my fellow Americans that I grew up with. And I said something to the effect that it really inspires me when I see the 80-year-old lady who's out hustling with a fruit stand selling fruit, just making her thing go and doing it. And this guest just jumped all over me and said, oh, no, that's just terrible. You don't want to have 80-year-old ladies selling fruit. That's terrible. She's being abused. I'm like, oh, my gosh, you completely missed the point. At all levels of life, in all levels of society, seeing that hustle gene at whatever level of education, IQ, et cetera, that alone just is fantastic for society. Yeah, yeah, very much. I mean, most of the time it comes out of necessity, right? That's a really key point, though. Necessity drives what so much? So, huh? It does. It 100%. That's the mother of all innovation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, speaking of innovation, let's talk about tinkering. Let's talk about sticking with something. Something doesn't work in one direction. You keep playing with it the other direction. Who's the most interesting tinkerer that you've bumped into in all your time? Somebody that just kept plugging away and went down the path and there's something to this tinkering mindset that this isn't what they really teach in school, is it? No, they don't. One of the interesting stories that I feature in the book and kind of interview I did is with Nat Turner, who started Flatiron Health. That's a company that was acquired for $2 billion by Roche. What they did was it's a real world evidence database of what treatments work on what cancers. They sell this software to cancer oncology centers they collect data on what pharmaceuticals are working on what type of patients with what type of backgrounds. And the story that Nat and his co-founder, Zach, they've taken for, for the past kind of decade before starting this company was very fascinating to me. They think very deep about their every next step, and sometimes it takes them a year or two to figure that out, but they eventually do. They've, they've started, I think, three companies at the point of Flatiron together. Now I think they've started a bunch of bunch more companies and investment firms and stuff together. They didn't necessarily stick to one industry. They started from selling baseball cards to selling pizza on campus and creating a pizza delivery company on, on campus to starting an advertising technology company, which Google acquired a couple of years later, and eventually starting this company in the healthcare and pharmaceutical space. I loved the way that 
in each of these steps, they thought about it. So for example, before starting Flatiron Health for two years, they didn't start the company. They were still employed by Google and they would go and talk to every oncologist they could find. You see that it's about these soft skills of learning more and having access to these people that mattered most in their stories. Each step, they created credibility for themselves and created a chain of trust that helped them talk to the next oncologist, talk to the next pharmaceutical person, even though they knew nothing about that industry. None of them were doctors. None of them came from that background. None of them worked in that industry. They used their credibility to go and learn more than anybody else about this kind of industry that nobody was going after. And they brought the technology talent that you can find at Google to join them and start this company and go after healthcare and pharmaceuticals. Those are the thinking that inspires me how you can go and move from one idea to another. And in the case of Flatiron, you know, they tried four or five different ideas. It was first like a health insurance idea, then a second diagnostics medical idea. So they changed the idea a bunch and thinker through their very to finally eventually coming up with the idea of Flatiron Health. I'm scanning my gray matter right now to a story to add as a book into that. There's a Hollywood producer, I believe his last name is Tull. He got started running coin op laundromat services in upstate New York. Someone's going to have to fact check me on that. I'm pretty sure that's accurate. Coin operated laundromat services. He then got his claim to fame and made his $1 billion net worth as the producer of the Dark Knight film series. Wham, bam. Thank you, ma'am. Right? We're coin op laundromat. How does that work? Part of this is really, as an individual, you have to imagine, and you kind of hinted at this as companies get big. When companies get big, they can take their eye off the prize, can't they? An opportunity is just everywhere. In the case of the story that you said, it's a very similar story to the founders of Flatiron Health in that they used that initial success and initial credibility that they had built to go in and venture out in a different space and industry. But they used that credibility that they had built to, I assume, connect with and network with people in Hollywood get investments and project finance for what he was producing. So it's the same thing in startups, in projects, in art, I would guess, that it's very important to try to find those small successes on the way to establish credibility and be able to you know, attract talent and move to the next thing that you have to do. One last area that I want to go with you, timing. When people decide to go down the path to launch, to be a founder, so timing can be tricky. It really looks great in 1997. I mean, the money spigot is on. Everything in the world is being funded. Uh, a little less so in probably 2001. The dot-com bubble really knocks some people out. Talk to me about the idea of timing and when, what the data shows for founders, specifically also bull and bear markets. Generally, people will like to think, well, if it's a booming bull market, the money spigot and people that want to fund things are going to be there. And if it's the depths of March of 2009, everyone's scared out of their mind and there's no money flowing. Speak to this issue of what the data showed for founders, for startups, when it comes to the timing. Two data points on that. One, in absolute case, so without thinking about recessions, bull or bear market, a lot of people think that you have to be first to market. You have to be the first company to try that specific idea in the market. And when you look at the data, 70% of billion dollar companies were not first to market. These are like the Googles of the world, which were like the eighth company that was trying the same idea, but they were trying to be a better executor of that. So 30% was first time to market. Another 30% was second time to fifth time. And 40% was companies that came to market on the six times or after, companies like Google. And that's basically, again, reflects back on the idea that specifically, you know, if you're first or second or fifth, that does not matter. What matters more is where you are in terms of tailwinds that can help you become a more successful company. So a lot of these very successful billion-dollar startups, they were launched close to an inflection point. So for example... Oscar Health, which creates a health insurance product, it was launched right after the Affordable Care Act was reenacted by the Supreme Court. That created the individual health insurance market, and that was what gave a boost to the business of Oscar Health. Same thing for Epic and Cerner, companies in the medical records. Regulation 
made sure that hospitals and every healthcare provider has to use electronic records. And these two companies became very successful because of that. Same thing for Plaid in financial technologies. And that somehow also gets you close to what you said. It is important to be close to inflection point. It is important to consider the, the hype cycles of the different products that come and go. For example, wearable technology, this was a hot thing back in 2013 and 2014. And now AirPods have come in and AirPods on their own is one of the top 20 companies, just the business of AirPods, of technology companies. So things go in their cycles. And then there was this value of death, I would say, in the past five years about anybody who was building a smartwatch or a wearable device or an ear pod or anything like that. Same thing, this macro level recessions and bull markets and bear markets, they do have an impact on the number of companies that get funded, the valuations and the amount of money invested. However, it was not a very major impact. It was about 25% reduction in valuation, at least in the 2008 cycle. When you look at the companies, there's a lot of billion dollar companies that was created right at the recession. In fact, the number of unicorns that are founded in 2007 and 2008 was more than any other cohort, any other year. Those two years, this is the companies like Okta and Uber and Square that was founded within that two year period that was the recession. If it's not a bull market, it's fine to start a company. And you know, if you can get funding, perfect. It might be easier to also hire talent. And a lot of very successful companies were created in the depths of recession. I talked to one of them, the founder of Cloudflare, Michelle Zatlin. In the book, that company was started right at the recession. Now that's a $30, $40 billion company. It does have an impact in the ability of getting funding and valuation and stuff. But at the end of the day, a lot of very successful companies were founded and funded in both types of funding environments. You said that Google was eighth. So I was jotting down five that I can remember that were ahead of Google, Excite, InfoSeq, AltaVista, Lycos, Yahoo. I can't remember. There's probably a couple that I forgot. But I remember using all those web pages, all those search engines, making sure my website was in all of those and whatnot. But how did that happen? What was going on? What was the autopsy of what was going on in the boardrooms, the offices of those five that I just mentioned that allowed Google, who was way behind, maybe not even yet started, to come into existence? It would be a fascinating autopsy to go back and and find out if anybody's even willing to admit what was going on that allowed Google to come in and eat everyone's lunch, huh? In the case of Google, that's my understanding from what I read. It, it was purely better technology and the idea for PageRank that rather than looking at each of these pages in abstract, why don't we look at them as a graph, as a network and see how each page is kind of connected to other pages on the internet and people are linking from one page to another. That was the case for Google. In terms of Facebook, same case. And I asked this question from Peter Thiel, who was the first institutional investor in Facebook. There was a bunch of companies before Facebook, some of them they had also invested in, MySpace and everything else. They did not succeed. Other than technical superiority, the point for Facebook was real identity. So Facebook was the first social network that focused on having real identities. The fact that it was requiring uh, university emails, there was less troll and there was less fictional personalities, people who wanted to be anonymous. So a lot of social networks before Facebook where people were trying to be anonymous there, where people were trying to create a different persona. Facebook cracked the code of real identity, creating a mirror of your real identity in the internet world. That was what made them different and eventually made Facebook more successful compared to the networks before them. So a lot of times, you know, there is something different about them. And on such a basic level, as you bring up the Facebook example, it's really about trust at a human level, a visceral level. We want to be able to trust if we're going to use these tools and we can't see them in person, we want to know they're real people. It's such a simple idea. But as you point out, Facebook was built on that. Exactly. Exactly. Cool stuff, Ali. Great job. Lots of work. People are going to have to go check out all the details. I took you around just touching on some things. The book, Super Founders, What Data Reveals About Billion Dollar Startups. I will always love anybody that finds a great story from the data alone because too few people look at the data and the data has so many stories buried in it. But as you said in the very beginning, it's a lot of work. 
and you don't necessarily know if there's going to be a reward or if anybody's interested, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, where would you like to send people to? What website would you like to direct people to? The book is sold. Any of our books are sold. You can find it on Amazon, Audible, Kindle, some indie bookstores as well. The website for the book is superfoundersbook.com. Cool. Is there a second book coming? Is this the first one for you? This is actually my second book. I've written a book on physics before. That doesn't count. That does not count. How many people can understand it, right? Well, enough people. <laughs> <laughs> did it sell well? It did sell well. That's why I'm saying enough people. Cool, cool. Thanks, man. I appreciate you coming on. Of course. I was glad to be here. And thank you very much for the well thought of questions. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.